Hello and welcome in to the Recruiting Blitz here at Inside Nebraska. I am Greg Smith, Senior Recruiting Analyst here at Inside Nebraska. I am joined once again for the second episode of the, of the show uh, by Jansen Coburn. Jansen is a staff writer and digital uh, creator for us. Jansen, man, how are you today? I'm doing good, Greg. It's been an eventful day. How was your, uh, how was your drive back from uh, Omaha? You just got back to Lincoln. Was that, was that smooth sailing? Yeah, so to, to pull the curtain back here, like we, <laughs> you never know uh, what's going to happen in the world of recruiting. So we are recording this on Saturday um, to pull it all the way back. Um, I had gotten word from Sue Lafutu himself uh, this morning that he told me, hey, I'm thinking about committing tomorrow, which would have been Sunday, right? Um, as of when we talked about that very early uh, this morning, actually, it was like, it honestly was like 6.30 a.m. Central Time. He's in California, so it, had, it was 4.30 his time. I don't know why he was up and talking to a recruiting reporter, but he did, sent me a message. Um, and so he said that, hey, I'm thinking about committing tomorrow. His original commitment date was actually going to be on signing day. And so, okay, there's your thing. We can go ahead and start to get some stuff ready. We'll be all good for tomorrow, right? Well, I'm driving back. I wanted to go see my friend's baby and have uh, like an early dinner with them. We go out there. We have dinner. I'm driving back from Papillion, um, and I get the alert on the phone. Pull over to a gas station, kind of coordinate with everybody um, to figure out like if everybody had all of their stuff ready, um, the graphic from you, if somebody was available to hit publish on it, all of that. And just to let you guys know, that is often how these things go. It is not always, the, you know, we get uh, so, like even if you get a heads up that something may be coming. That doesn't mean that that kid doesn't then change his mind, which totally his right. Like he can bump it up, he can move back, whatever makes him comfortable. Um, but yeah, this one was was a little different. So it was a very eventful uh, drive back from Papillion. Got back on the road and made it here on time, I should add, uh, to do the pod with, with Jansen tonight. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, Greg, because I think you're the unsung hero today because you would have been <laughs> tweeting it while you were driving. So were you one hand typing out the tweet, the other hand... <laughs> On the no, stand label. I got really lucky that when when I got the alert, and like the alerts also come to the watch, so I can just quickly look to see. So I quickly looked, and then I got off the road. Um, there was a gas station, and luckily that was right there. So I pulled on over, um, and we can now add that to the list of spots between Omaha and Lincoln that I've done work at. Um, there's a couple other gas stations right off of I-80 um, that I pulled off of. There's a McDonald's um, that I've definitely used their Wi-Fi. Uh, to do some stuff as well. So yeah, it, it, the life of a recruiting reporter um, it is always a little eventful, even when you have the info, because we had posted on the site just this morning that I, I put my future cast in for Sue to be in the class. I just thought it was going to be tomorrow. Uh, but we definitely have another fun episode planned for you guys today with plenty of topics uh, for us to blitz through. So what do you got first for us, Jansen? Yeah, Greg, you gotta love the the wild west of recruiting, but this this Always. sets us up nicely to talk about what we were originally going to talk about, <laughs> which was their visit weekend and how they had they had six visitors and five of them were uncommitted, so they're now five for five. Uh, let's just start with Sua. Talk about uh, his commitment, how that all came to be. I know you you were thrown off a little bit by it. We all were with the timeline, but what does his commitment mean for Nebraska? Yeah, the timeline itself was, was a little bit of a throw off. The actual commitment itself was not. I think that we always, I personally, I thought that it was heading this way towards Tim commitment committing to Nebraska. Now, he was previously committed to Washington um, before he was committed to Nebraska. It had been a while, uh, months now, since he had left Washington's class. Um, and he's a kid that has that plays on the defensive line at a powerhouse program out in California, uh, Don Bosco Prep um, out there that has, like, I think the number one defensive player in the country, I believe, or the defensive lineman um, in the country is on his team. So, like, that team, I think, had, like, it's had, they have so many scholarship players that come off of that team on a yearly basis. So he's just the latest one. Um, but he's 6'4", 295 is what we have him listed on, on Rivals. I do think that the plan is eventually to kind of bulk him up, um, get him in the lab with Corey Campbell, the strength coach, um, and put some additional weight on him and get him ready to play interior and be more of an athletic interior guy uh, for Nebraska's defense. And he has the tools to do that. We've seen that in kind of the camp setting. Um throughout you know the times that he's been in camps he was slowed down a little bit by injuries uh, throughout his high school career so it, it's more of a 
There's not necessarily a project because when he's played, he's been good. Um, it's more of a, a flyer just based on the, the actual injury history that he's had and trying to make sure that he, they can get him healthy and keep him out there. Uh, but it's an interesting get for a team that needs to continue to stockpile high school defensive linemen. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned St. John Bosco High School. I mentioned in the last episode, I'm from California, and we actually played St. John Bosco in the playoffs, and it was not pretty then. So they're loaded <laughs> with talent. Every uh, there year. were there were five other guys that were on that visit, and the class is uh, five guys heavier now with players, and you got to talk to all of them. So. Let's run through those guys that were there last weekend. What did you hear just about the whole visit weekend amongst all the recruits? Yeah, I think that one, to take it overall first, and it will work its way down, like drill down from each guy. Like, I think the big overall feel um, is that this these guys really like, these the recruits and their families really, really like this staff. Like, that's something that continues to come up about how personable they are um, and about how good they are at building relationships with these recruits when they're on campus. Like, it's remarkable how consistent the messaging is from recruits about how much they like this staff. Like, it's not... And, and, you know, for them, a lot of these guys, they're new to being recruited by them because so many of them came from the NFL, right? And so it's not like they had previous relationships with these guys um, in almost every case. So that's really kind of interesting to see. And I think something neat to think about as a Husker fan, like moving forward for the 2024 class, um, is that relationship building and the ability to be able to do that. Now, Jacob Hood, um, the offensive lineman from Georgia, the latest Georgia transfer, the, 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 they call them corn dogs um, online. Is that the name that we've officially settled on with all? of these Georgia transferred the third one uh, for Nebraska uh, this offseason, but he's a big man um, at 6'7", 6 6'8", 6 300 plus pounds. Um, he's raw because he did not play a ton at Georgia this past year. Um, he, he was a redshirt freshman. He's a redshirt freshman right now um, coming out of Georgia, so he's got his full-time eligibility left, um, and I think for him, just like everyone else, that family feel um, is something that he really felt, and he wanted to get a shake and a chance to be able to show what he can do. I think it, it gets really tough at a place like Georgia to really fight and claw your way to that to that top spot to be able to start because they bring in so much talent um, on a yearly basis. So I kind of understand how he ended up in that situation. Um, probably to me, the most interesting guy that was on that visit weekend that did end up committing like they all did um, was uh, Ishmael Smith Flores, the tight end, hybrid tight end um, out of Arlington High School. And Arlington High School sounds familiar because that is Bob Wager's uh, former school. So both him and Jeremiah Charles Charles, the wide receiver that also committed, both came from that high school. So Wager had a relationship with him, uh, with them both. And the thing that really interests me most about Smith Flores is that he talked about how he loved his time sitting down with um, Satterfield, Marcus Satterfield, the offensive coordinator, and how he explained to, to Ishmael about how he would be utilized in the offense. Now, he said that, you know, Satterfield pitched him on lining up some in the backfield, being kind of in line, being an H back, going even out wide and playing a little bit of like traditional wide receiver. So really that versatile type of playmaker that you see a lot in college football right now, right? Like you see that, you see it in the NFL. I think of Travis Kelsey and those guys um, that you see running around in the NFL like that's the type of player that they believe that he can be um, and, and so that'll be really interesting to see how he goes or how he progresses moving forward now his teammate um, Jeremiah Charles is a guy who has not played football very long I think it's, this year was just his first year and it's a really neat story of how they found him because of Wager but then Wager, Matt Rule, Evan Cooper, the secondaries coach, all went down to see them play basketball at Arlington High um, the Tuesday before his official visit, and he threw down three or four dunks. They, they were sold on the athleticism, took him in the office and offered him, and he cried when he got the office offer because it was such a big deal to him. That was a good indicator, by the way, that he would eventually end up picking Nebraska. Um, and by the way, Ishmael Smith-Flores also said to me that he thought coming into the weekend, he knew that he was going to pick Nebraska. Um, and so whatever they're doing ahead of time, to kind of get guys ready for these visits is really working because they're not having to make up a ton of ground. Um, they're already sitting in a really good spot when they start these visits, which, which is a really great thing. Um, maybe the best player um, that came in this weekend or this past weekend was Demetrius Bell. Um, he's the highest rated for sure. Four-star guy out of Tennessee. Um, he was the highest rated uncommitted player before this week um, out of Tennessee. And he's a wide receiver that I know that internally they're very high on him. Like they believe that Demetrius Bell has 
has NFL type of potential and that he's a Sunday player and they think that they got to steal. Um, and when you watch the tape and I know that, you know, Steve and Jay will have a black shirt breakdown about him as well, which you can find on this YouTube channel too. Um, and that, and they really were high on him as well. I think that's a kid that has a lot of potential um, and really could be, if you think about it this way, you think about all the receivers that are coming in, Demetrius Bell could really be a replacement um, for Barry Jackson, the, the wide receiver out of Georgia who left the class um, on signing day in kind of a weird way and <laughs> committed to Louisville um, without really saying much to, to anyone about it, um, at least media-wise. We didn't really know all that much about the situation. But no, it was a very productive weekend, um, obviously, with them going five for five. And I, do, I don't want to let this go, though, without us mentioning uh, they had a commit, a commit, a signee, actually, which is very rare, on his official visit this weekend, too. Jason Machachak, um, the big offensive lineman slash defensive lineman, so he told our Steve Mark that they're talking about defensive line now um, out of South Dakota, 6'4", 3'10", uh, really big kid, good size, but doesn't look 3'10 at all. And it's pretty nimble when you watch him on film. Um, he was here this past weekend, and it's really neat that he was able to get his take his official visit because when he wanted to take that official visit before committing to Nebraska, he was stuck at home because of a snowstorm. Um, and I feel bad in a way for him because then he makes it to his official visit, and it's the official visit weekend that five other guys end up committing from his weekend. And so we're talking about all of those guys and not giving him any love. So I definitely wanted to make sure that we shouted out but our boy, Jason M, as we call him around here, uh, who got to take his official visit and had great things to say as well. Yeah, a lot of commits. And then there's another one that might be a little low key. We'll talk about it anyways. Obviously, whenever a walk on commits, it's usually not as big a splash news, but Nebraska did get a transfer commit for the fullback position, and we were interested to see where they would go with that and how they'd recruit the position. Why don't you talk a bit about the fullback commitment and what that means? Yeah, Trevor Ruth, um, who comes over to Nebraska, he's a he is a Nebraskan, um, so he was he was a former Seward Blue Jay, um, and he was also at UNK um, before he ended up transferring to Nebraska uh, this past week as a walk on to play fullback. And he's about six foot two thirty five. Um, and what makes this really interesting, and why? Well, there's a couple of things that make this really interesting. One is that just the pure mention of fullback, the word fullback by Marcus Satterfield at that press conference got everybody in a tizzy. Um, and he talked about you know go back and watch the tape. I've used a fullback, um, you know, in my past. Now, we've seen, you know, we, we have dug into some of that South Carolina tape here recently. And while they they use someone in a fullback-like role, it is a lot like that that H-back that you think of, kind of like um, what Ishmael Smith-Flores was talking about, about motioning into the backfield and playing that. But even that's a little bit different than what you're thinking about here, um, even with those traditional H-backs, because those guys are usually 6364 and a little bit heavier um, than what uh, Smith-Flores is. Um, but even where Ruth is right now in his body type, that is more of a traditional fullback. I am fascinated to see, because I know so many of you listening and watching um, are also fascinated to see if this ends up being a thing within this offense. And I don't know. I, I, we don't know the answer at this point because we haven't seen, you know, obviously there have been no spring football practices. There's nothing that we've seen. There are no reports coming out of those. Obviously, we'll see kind of with the spring game when we get there, if they show their hand. I do expect this to be, even though I, I will say this with Natrick, with the receivers, all the receivers that they're bringing in. I do think that this is going to be a run first offense. I think that this is going to be, it's going to look, in my opinion, more Matt Rule Temple than Matt Rule Baylor. And we just, we kind of have to see how that plays out. But with so much talk about running the ball and winning the line of scrimmage and how you have to adapt your offense to the weather in the Big Ten, it just lends me to think they're going to play more run heavy, like hitch in the mouth type of football. And at least having a fullback on the roster, because they don't really have anyone that fits the bill before Trevor Ruth transferred in, will help that quest. Yeah, Greg, let's, uh, let's look into the future a little bit. And of course, oh. we can't. We can't go too far into the future of Nebraska's recruiting class without mentioning Dylan Ryla, of course. And once again, there's a little more Dylan Ryla news on uh, the Nebraska. They sent the whole staff minus Matt Rule, so all the assistants went out to Arizona to see him. What did you hear about that? Yeah, so first, it, it, it's a really, it's an interesting thing. And, and I think that you have to 
on one hand, if you're a fan seeing that, you go, okay, they're really serious about this recruitment, which obviously they are. They have communicated to him, and this has been reported uh, like almost everywhere now. Like, and we did report this that the, Nebraska has told Dylan that he that he is their number one target for the 2024 class. Like, he is it. He's the number one guy, and they they want him more than anyone, right? Which is great to hear if you're a kid. I bet that that feels good, right? But it's not like it's uncommon because he is the number one player in the entire country, and he's that for a reason. He's that good. But what I thought when I first heard that is that means them doing this means that sending all, you know, every assistant coach out there to, to see his high school or to be at his high school and say hi slash bump into him, whatever the rules allow, that says that they're in the race. You don't do that on the final day, basically, of being able to go out and get into high schools, take every coach that you have and send him there if you don't think that there's a chance that you can continue to advance your chances and your prospects of landing him. I think that that's an important thing to remember kind of in this whole grand scheme of things. And the reason that that's important and all, everything matters in this recruitment, because when you're talking about a recruitment of th this high profile, um, and Dylan is at USC this weekend or today um, on Saturday as we record this, um, he has every option in the world, right? Like he can go any place in America that he chooses. And so because of that, Nebraska needs to be very like intentional and diligent about how they recruit him and they need to actually build a relationship. There, There's so much talk about all the things surrounding this recruitment, whether it's NIL, Nebraska needs to come up with a package that Florida couldn't come up with for that quarterback that they lost, Rashada, like, I, or like, you know, maybe because he wants, you know, the, the le to continue the legacy of his family because his dad was a Hall of Famer here, you know, his uncle is, is coaching here, all of those things will play some factor, but I still maintain that the biggest thing that Nebraska can do is build a legitimate relationship with Dylan Rayola and his family. Um, and I will continue to say that all of them need to feel the love from Nebraska and they all need to be able to trust Nebraska. That's the number one thing that all of this boils down to is a trust factor between Dylan and the, the Matt Rule staff and then between Dom and mom with Matt Rule staff as well. For what it's worth, I, you ask what I'm hearing. I hear that Nebraska is in a good position here I do think that they're right there in the mix with Georgia and I think that those to me are the top two schools and we'll see what happens coming out of this USC visit maybe goes checks out Oregon I know Colorado's trying to get in as well we'll see kind of where that goes but I think that those first four are the, are the main teams right now I, I just think that Nebraska has continued to put its best foot forward I think that Dominic really likes what he's heard from Matt Rule I think that Dylan really likes what he's hearing from them based on what I hear I, it, but it's going into me at right now on January 28th, I've checked the date, boil down to heart versus head. Your His heart might actually be with Nebraska right now, but your head is looking at that monster in Athens and saying, man, I could just slide right into that thing and can, and we can just keep this rolling, right? Like they're, they're, they have the talent already there. We know the system works. Whereas at Nebraska, you're taking a little bit more of a leap of faith and that's where the rubber kind of meets the road. And that's where, again, the trust factor will come back into play. Yeah, surely his recruitment is far from over. There's another recruit on <laughs> yes. Nebraska's radar that they're looking into the future who's far from over and that's quarterback 2025 class stone saunders uh you spoke to him recently talk about that yeah he's a really interesting prospect and it's funny because you know when you look at a 2025 quarterback i posted him on the board and i keep saying i said it on the board i will say it here on our insiders board um, and i'll say it again here on this podcast like it's a big deal that he was on campus like yes it's too early in the process for 25s to be all of them to be rated. So that's why he's not rated yet. But he's going to be a strong four-star um, quarterback um, by the time they do start to rate. And this will be here over the next couple of months when they start rating 25s once they close the door on the 23 group. Um, he's a kid that won the state championship, helped win his team win, win the state championship. He threw over 50 touchdowns um, this year for his team. 60, I think it was 69% completion percentage. And they're not playing in like in a small division either. They're out there in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's he's got some connections to the staff. Um, Adam DeMichael is, is an offensive analyst with the staff that has been with Rule at various spots. Um, he's from the same area um, that the quarterback is from in Pennsylvania. Um, and so for him to come out here, and this is a kid that has offers from Georgia, from Clemson, Colorado. 
other schools, uh, Tennessee, um, other schools kind of in that range of either very buzzy programs right now, like Colorado, or in that range of teams that are winning 10 games right now, like Tennessee just did, or like Georgia, right? And obviously with their national championship. So like, he's a really important piece to also kind of start to put the puzzle together about what type of quarterbacks that Matt Rule and Marcus Satterfield want down the road, because he's more of a pro style guy that can run. Right. Um, and he told me that Matt Rule said to him that he's the perfect quarterback for their system. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. All right. Let's uh, shift back to the more present times. Now, Nebraska had one more visit weekend right before the signing day. And as far as we know, there was only one uncommitted prospect that they brought on campus. That's DeAndre Barnes. Have you had a chance to talk to him or just what are your evaluations on him and where he stands? Yeah, so I, I talked to him before the visit because that, as of this recording, he's on campus, uh, probably hanging out with players as of right now um, when we're recording. Um, and he was really excited. I think the thing, he is from um, Regis Jesuit High School in Colorado, which may sound familiar, uh, because that is the high school that Hayden Moore, the former uh, linebacker commit for Nebraska for this class who decommitted and committed to Michigan, um, signed with Michigan. They, they play for the same high school team. And there's been other players on that team because they always have a good team um, that have also been either on visits to Nebraska and he told me that a lot of those guys have told him that you know Nebraska is different what you're going to see at Nebraska and the types of facilities and the fan support and all of that is going to be a different level um, than some of the other places that you've seen so he was ready to see that uh, for himself in person and how much different it is kind of at a Big Ten school and the level of support um, that, that that is given to those programs so it'll be interesting to see he's another guy um, that is a, is a long athletic guy that he's a he's a state champion in track I feel like we can we should we could probably just create a sounder um every time that somebody say track or somebody was a state champion in track because that's going to come up a lot uh he won the 200 meter dash um out in Colorado and he'll probably repeat again this year he's a really fast athletic kid um that was productive as well um out there in high school he had I think it was 55 total tackles and five interceptions as a senior this year um and so he, he's an interesting prospect um that I wouldn't be surprised if, if Nebraska makes a really strong push uh to try and land him as well all right greg and the last question i had prepared for you is going to have to shift a little bit and it was okay. going to be if you had a prediction on who the next nebraska commit would have been and <laughs> two hours previous i think you know who your answer was but now that sue lafotu's in i guess i'll just ask you specifically about deandre barnes what are what do you think nebraska's chances are of hauling him in and rounding out the class yeah, I, I think that Nebraska has a really good chance here at, at, with, with Barnes. Um, and Air Force and Wyoming, I believe, were, were two of the schools um, that he has already also visited. I know North Carolina had been involved in a couple of other schools as well. Um, but as we're starting to see, and this is something that I think I'll, I may end up writing about as we get you know beyond uh, National Signing Day, Nebraska, Matt Rule, they've done a great job of when they get guys on campus, they've been converting these guys to commits. Like I, we talked about them going, what, five for five this past weekend, but it's not that dissimilar in previous weekends either with some of these visit weekends that they've had. They've done a really good job. If they get them here, um, they're getting them to commit. Um, and I don't see a reason why Barnes wouldn't end up being much different. Um, I, I really like the chances of them ending up with Barnes to kind of round out the class. As always, and I will definitely put the asterisks on it for this particular staff, we could get off this thing and I could find out that there's another guy on campus. We don't know that, uh, but we'll see uh, because this, this staff has done a really nice job, too, of also being stealthy about those things because there are plenty of guys that have come up that we haven't known anything about. It just feels like it's a little too quiet, uh, even with the one guy on campus, uh, for to finish off this whole thing. Greg, that's all the questions I have for you, but I do want to say once more that if you have a question for us, you can comment it down below and we will answer that in a future episode, but uh, we will have more to talk about after the signing day because we're going to be doing another, uh, another one of these, but that's all I got, Greg, so I'll let you close us out. Yeah, we uh, yeah bonus episode coming up next week uh, to wrap up signing day. We'll have plenty to talk about as we get through that because uh, boy, there's been a lot that has happened with between the the recent run of commitments to the the, the regular signing class and then all of the transfers that have come in. Uh, well, again, like Jansen said, we'll also have your questions in the next episode as well um, as we wrap up. Matt rules, I guess his first signing class slash transition class. The 24 will be the first full one, but as we wrap up, Matt rules uh, transition 
information class here. Uh, make sure you're keeping it locked at Inside Nebraska, Nebraska.rivals.com. Like and subscribe to this YouTube or like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel to so make sure you get these videos directly in your feed. And we will catch you guys next time.